Let's take our Bibles this morning, open up with me, if you would, to Mark's Gospel, chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, as you're turning there, uh, Dr. John Getch is the executive vice president at uh, West Coast Baptist College, and he gives the following illustration. He tells about an old Norwegian who kept very careful notes about his life and the things that he did, and he hit his 80th birthday, and he decided he would go back over the notes of his life and kind of compute how he had spent those 80 years. As he did, he found out that five of the 80 years was spent waiting for people, just waiting. He also spent a total of six months tying neckties, three months scolding children, and eight days telling dogs to lie down and be quiet. Well, every week of our lives brings us 168 hours. You get no more, you get no less. We all get the same amount of time. When somebody complained to Ralph Waldo Emerson that they did not have enough time, Emerson replied, well, I suppose you have all the time there is, which is exactly true. According to reports, the average person today spends 56 hours a week for rest and recuperation. We spend approximately 28 hours for eating and personal duties. We use 40 to 50 hours every week to earn a living. That leaves us with somewhere between 30 to 40 hours of discretionary time that we have to decide how are we going to use it. So that begs the question, how are we going to use those 30 to 40 hours per week that are discretionary time, that is, is time that's not already allocated to something that we have to do? To put it another way, that's our free time. 30 to 40 hours a week. And I know some of you are saying, well, I wish I had 30 to 40 hours free time. Well, I, I challenge you, maybe you don't have 30 to 40 hours free time, but I would challenge you in a week to maybe document how you spend your hours. And you might be surprised what you find. In fact, let's stretch this out just a little bit since we're on day one of a brand new year. If we are going to have between 30 to 40 hours per week, that means that we have between 1,560 to 2,080 hours per year to use as we please. Let's extrapolate that out into smaller nuggets if we could. That means that we are going to have anywhere between 93,600 minutes to 124,800 minutes. Want to stretch that out even farther? You're going to have 5 million 616 seconds, 16,000 seconds between that and 7,488,000 seconds. Those seconds, if you will, think about a deep well, and that deep well is filled with a drop, and every drop is a second. Your well is full of between 5,616,000 to 7,488,000 drops. How are you going to use those drops? And the reason that I compare it that way is because of this. If we were to go into that well and we were to take an eyedropper and we were to dip down that well and squeeze it and we'd bring it out and we'd say, oh, drop, 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 drop. We look down that well and we go, well, that wasn't anything. That wasn't much at all. The problem is, is that we keep doing that every single day until we get to the end of a year where we were at yesterday and the well is empty. We say, how did I get here? What did I do with all those drops? I like to have January 1st on a Sunday. This is great. We start out with mostly all the drops in the well. So this is a great time for you and I to figure out how are we going to spend those drops. Pastor Paul Chapel at West Coast Baptist College and Lancaster Baptist Church he had spent about 25 years in, in ministry, and after about 25 years, he had a breakdown where he collapsed, and he realized that he had not been stewarding his life very well. He had not been stewarding those drops of time very well. And so he wrote a book entitled Stewarding Life, and it's a great book that talks about how we should steward our lives. Today, we want to start talking about how we need to steward our lives for 2023. Should the Lord tarry, 
how are we going to spend those drops of seconds in our life? And to know that when we get to the end, should the Lord tarry, let's say we get to December 31st, 2023, the well is empty. Can we look back at that empty well and go, oh, wow, every drop was used wisely. That's what we need to do, but we're going to do this by looking at 12 areas of our life. I know, you're looking at your watch and going, 12? Sunday morning, 12? We'll never beat Eastland Baptist to the restaurants. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We're not going to do all 12 this morning, all right? It's going to stretch out for us a little bit. But what we're going to do is, as I give you the points... You're going to grade yourself, and I want you to grade yourself before we explain the point, because I want us to see how the grade would change as we explain the point, all right? So the first area of life that we need to give ourselves a grade on is our walk with God. That should be the most important thing, and it is the most important thing of all the 12 things that we will look at over the next few sermons. What kind of a grade would you give yourself? Be honest. What do you think your walk with God is? Now, some of you have not picked up a pen. You're not playing. You need to play. All right? Even if you don't remember to get the point down, at least write the grade. Give yourself a grade because at the end of the point, I want to see if the grade changes. And I don't mean me seeing it. I don't care what your grade is. That's between you and God. That's not between you and me. I'm not going to ask you for the report card at the end of the message, all right? So in Mark chapter 12, let's look at this. You've given yourself a grade, Mark 12, verses 30 and 31. The scripture says this, Jesus Christ, in fact, let's jump to verse 29. Jesus answered him, the first of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. As we look at that this morning, I think those two verses right there help us to determine what our walk with God is like. And as we tear these verses apart, we're going to be looking at a lot of Scripture this morning, if you're not a fast flipper, be a fast writer, and you can go back and look at these scriptures because uh, we're going to back up all these points with scripture. If we want to know what our walk with God is like, we need to look at the first greatest commandment and the second greatest commandment. The first greatest commandment, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, first of all, the Bible says, with all of thy heart. What does that look like? How do we know if we are loving the Lord with all of our heart? Go back with me. Keep a marker here in Mark chapter 12. Go back to Matthew chapter 10 with me. In Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 37. Matthew 10, verse 34. Jesus Christ says this. He says, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This morning, where is your heart? Who is it that has the profound love and devotion of your heart. A lot of times people will refer to God and they'll refer to Christianity that there ought to be this great unity and God is the great unifier and all that kind of stuff. All right, that has to be explained because the Lord is only the great unifier if your unity is around the Lord. If your unity is around the Word of God, you must be born again. There cannot be unity if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior. And there cannot be unity without agreement to the Word of God. So when we look at how this is played out in our lives, where does the loyalty of our heart lie? Who is the greatest love interest of our life? 
If you were to be asked that question, who do you love more than anyone else? Now, of course, we're going to give the right answer because we're in church, right? But let's perpetuate the calendar ahead to the future. And let's go to February the 14th, the next big holiday that they're already decorating for in the stores. All right? When you look at those cards and you go down the Hallmark and the American Greetings aisle and you see all those cards, there's all sorts of topics of people that you can give a card to. You know, there's spouse, there's children, there's parents, grandparents, all these different divisions. As you walk through that aisle, who is the greatest love of your heart? Is there a card there for God? Can we honestly say that God is the premier love of our life? Through the years, it's been sad to watch many homes that capitulate and they change to accommodate a wayward child. And when I say capitulate and accommodate, that means parents that once stood strong no longer stand strong because that dear child has lost their marbles. They've gone all sorts of different ungodly and biblical routes and they are not going to practice 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Oh no, no way am I going to do that. Practice it on everybody else, but not on my own kids. Not on my own family. As you look at this, Jesus came to set at variance father against a man against his own father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against father-in-law. Man's foes shall be they of their own household. That speaks of division not unity. Why would a home be divided? It's because a home is not as a whole following Christ. And our greatest love has got to be Jesus. And we will find out very, very quickly in some of the most special relationships of our life, just where our heart's really at. We are to love the Lord with all of our heart, then with all of our soul. Look at verses 38 and 39 of Matthew 10. The Bible says, And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. He that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. Are we willing to lay down our life for Christ? Maybe that will never be required of us here in the United States of America. Maybe at least not this year, but it very well could in the time to come. But do we love our life more than we love Christ? We can take this further. What about our emotions? What about the things that grieve us? Do we grieve over the things that grieve the Lord? Or do we just kind of slough them off, shrug them off like it's nothing? The Bible says we're to love the Lord with all of our soul. That is a Full, out-and-out, out, dedication, commitment, giving it all. Lord, if it means my life, it's yours. Take it. Everything belongs to you, Lord. Here's the third one. We are to love the Lord with all of our mind. Go to Philippians chapter 2. With all of our mind, Philippians chapter 2. In Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. Do we love the Lord with all of our mind? The Bible says in verse 5 of chapter 2, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind of Christ is supposed to be in us. It is supposed to be governing our thought processes, our thought life. What is it that consumes our thinking? Where do we find our thoughts drifting off to most of the time? Listen to some of these verses. Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day. On our church sign as you came in this morning, Proverbs 16, 3. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Isaiah 26, 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. If our mind is where it ought to be, if we love the Lord our God with all of our mind, do you realize that obedience is going to follow? Obedience is going to follow out of our lives. John chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, 
keep my commandments. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments and His commandments are not grievous. If we love the Lord with all of our mind, the thought life will affect the actions of our life. So now we have to consider, I say, I love the Lord. Oh, yes, my walk with God is great. Do I love the Lord with all of my heart, with all of my soul, with all of my mind? Oh, here's the last one, with all of my strength. With all of my strength. Where do we expend our strength, our energy? Turn back to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, the admonition is given in the first two verses. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Does God get the best of our strength and our energies, or does God get our leftovers, our exhaustion, our bare minimum, the last few moments of the day? Do we come down to the end of the day? We have expended our time, our strength, our energy on everything else we got to do, and we get ready to go to bed, and it's like, oh, I haven't been in my Bible today. I haven't been in God's Word. I haven't spent any time in prayer. Lord, this just has not been a good day. I'll catch up with you tomorrow. God, you sit this one out. I've used up all I got. I got nothing left. Do we catch ourselves coming to Sunday morning or Sunday evening or Wednesday night services saying, I sure wish I didn't have to go to church. I wish I could, didn't have to do my particular ministry. I wish I wasn't so involved. Oh, but I guess I'll go. What about the strength of our finances? I know some of you are saying, hey, don't meddle preachers at the beginning of the year. What about the strength of our finances? Do we give to God first? What about the strength of our possessions? Does God get to use your possessions and mine, or are we withholding them from the Lord? Oh, you know, we've got, we've got two buses and a shuttle bus, two vans and a shuttle bus out in the garage. Can I be honest with you about something? Look how many vehicles are sitting in the parking lot. Three versus how many out here? I'll pick somebody up. Or we say... I don't want some kid's dirty shoes in my car. Well, I keep mine pristine. Oh, I wouldn't think of that. Well, I've got to, you know, I'm going to be doing other things after church. I don't have time to pick somebody up. I'm taking my car and I'm going to my place and I'm doing my thing. Or we say, well, I can't invite people over to my house. Why? I keep a tidy house and I keep this and I do that. People come in, they'll mess things up. Hasn't God given us those things? Does God have the strength of our possessions? Or do we say, well, Lord, it's brand new. When it's used for a while, then I'll let you have it. But I want to enjoy that new smell. I want that smell of formaldehyde in the new car. To, I want it to be all mine. I ain't sharing that with anybody else. You see... When we start talking about loving the Lord our God and our walk with God, it starts here. Look at your grade that you gave yourself at the beginning. Is your grade starting to drop? Are you looking at that grade and you're saying, oh, I was a little too generous with myself? We haven't even talked about the second commandment. So you want to go ahead and we'll meddle there a minute? Well, we're going to anyways, whether you want to or not. Go to Ephesians chapter 5 with me. Loving our neighbor as ourself. You say, but you don't know what my neighbors are. 
You don't know what they're like. You've never lived next door to them. Well, I don't see anything in Scripture that says good neighbors get blessed, bad neighbors get cursed. I don't see that in Scripture. Ephesians 5.29, the Bible tells us this, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. We have no problem doing this. We know how to love ourselves. If somebody was to ask you, or you were, somebody was to say, do you know how to love yourself? How would you know that you was loving yourself? Oh, you could answer that. Let's talk about how you're going to love yourself today. You're already looking at your watch. Your tummy's starting to grumble a little bit, so you're going to love yourself with some lunch right? Might be going out somewhere, or maybe you know that there's something in the crock pot at home, and by the time you get home from church, you can almost smell it from there, you know? You just, oh. some of your minds are drifting, or I've just helped your mind to drift. Others of you are thinking, well, come on now, we got to get to that restaurant. We got to do this, we got to do that. And then we're going to love ourselves this afternoon with maybe a little nap. Nothing wrong with a little nap. You say, oh, well, I can hardly wait to get home and get out of my dress clothes and get into my jammies, get into my sweats, crawl under my fluffy blanket, pull it up over my nose. <clears throat> if you do that, please set your alarm for church tonight. Others say, well, I'm not coming back tonight. I'm really going to love myself. No, that's hating yourself. Don't hate yourself. Love yourself. Get back here tonight. We know how to do that. Now, how do we love our neighbor? Well, Look in the, book of, in the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Are we loving our neighbor as ourself? Verse 3 of Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. So, do I consider you above me? The Jameson Fawcett Brown commentary writes this, Instead of fixing your eyes on those points in which you excel, fix them on those in which your neighbor excels you. So that deals with my thoughts, what I think about you, what you think about me. Do we esteem others better than ourselves? Second commandment, we are to love our neighbor. All right? Luke chapter 6. Let's take this farther. You say, well, I don't know. Nobody knows what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, they do. You want to know how? Luke chapter 6, verse 31. In Luke 6 and verse 31, and as ye would that men should do to you. Stop there. How many of you know how you would like to be treated by others? Would you put your hand up, please? Okay? You know how you would like others to treat you. Then it goes on to say, do ye also to them likewise. Does it specify if it's a nice person? Does it specify if it's somebody you'd like to go on vacation with, that you could enjoy their company? Does it say that? No, it's a general comment. It is a general application. So as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them. Philippians 2.3 was all about our thoughts. This is about our actions. Do I love my neighbor as myself? Am I thinking right about them? And am I doing them right? One more. And it, it keeps getting more meddlesome. Go to Matthew 18. By the way, I didn't write this, so don't get mad at me. Matthew 18, verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now don't try to be a math expert and say, well, that's 490. Okay, I'm counting. Boy, you're getting close. You know, that was 470, that was 480. 85, 490, ooh, getting close. We are supposed to forgive. 
even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven us. If, if our walk with the Lord is what it ought to be, we will love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And this second commandment, we will live, love others as we love ourselves. I know some of us are thinking, I can't forgive that person. You just don't know what they did. Don't confuse forgiveness with trusting them. It's not the same thing. Forgiveness is where I say I am not going to hold a grudge and ill feelings. I am not going to try to extract a pound of flesh. I'm not going to try to take revenge. I'm not going to hold on to the hurt. Pastor Richard Futrell writes this. He says, unforgiveness is the cancer of the soul. It is a spiritual prison, enslaving the one who refuses to let go, to leave behind, to forgive. We in stubborn blindness don't see the good God is doing when He teaches us to forgive. Instead, we see ourselves as losing out in some way, not getting the last word, not being on top of the pile like we think that we should be. Our grade for walking with God, now regrade yourself based on what we've seen in Scripture. Has the grade changed? Has it gone lower? Maybe it's gone higher. You say, wow, I didn't realize that's what that was. I, boy, so far so good. I like that. If you gave yourself a C, you say, well, that's okay. That's middle of the road. That's passing. That might work in math and history and English, but it doesn't work in the Christian life. A C is not acceptable. It is not acceptable. God wants us to excel. Am I suggesting that it's easy to excel in these things? Absolutely not. And I'm also going to tell you it's impossible to excel in these things if you're trying to do this on your own. It is only the Spirit of God dwelling within the child of God that makes this possible. That's the first area to grade ourselves. Here's the second area, identity. Identity. You say, well, I don't know how to grade myself on identity. Well, let me kind of explain that for a moment. Our identity is to be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now give yourself a grade. And then let me explain. I was in a doctor's office a couple of weeks ago, and I had to fill out a questionnaire uh, that I'd filled out a year ago. And they want you to refill out the, all the information. I'm like, why? It's like three pages front and back. Seriously? Just copy it over. Nothing's changed. And if it's changed, it's because of you. So you put the changes in. But one of the things that is there, you have to state how you identify. That's the big deal in our world today. Do you remember when there used to be only two choices? The biblical choice, the biological choice. Now there are at least seven choices. I had to identify as biological male, biological female, trans male, trans female, gender queer slash gender non-conforming, something else, or decline to answer. I was tempted to check the decline to answer because you're the doctor, you tell me. But then I thought, if I do decline to answer, they're going to think, he's having an identity crisis, now we're going to refer him to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. I thought, no, nah, let's just, this ain't the place to make the statement. Male, just leave it at that. It's ridiculous where things have gone. But you know what, Christians? We, as believers in Christ, are having an identity crisis worse than what people are having in this world. Turn your Bible to the book of Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I think believers in Christ have forgotten who we are, and we have forgotten how to act like who we are. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Verse 10. 
and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Chapter 3, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things of the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Do you see that constant repeated phrase, in Him, in God? Our life, our identity, Christian, is in Christ. That's who our identity is. Or at least that's what it's supposed to be. First of all, that evidence is internal, and it has to start there. There has to be the change of heart. That change of heart only comes about through salvation, through coming to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Anything else is just a cosmetic approach, and it won't last. Cosmetics wear off. What the Lord does in your heart doesn't wear off. We are sealed until the day of redemption. God's going to keep doing a good work in us until He calls us home. But because the work is internal, that work necessarily becomes external. That which the Lord is changing in our heart is going to work out of our lives and become evident on the outside. Go back to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. Christians who identify as Christians will have internal and external evidence. In Ephesians, or excuse me, Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 4, verses 22 through 24. The Bible says that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and holiness. When you read the chapter in context, you read the verses before these, you read the verses after these, it talks about things that are being done on the external. That which has happened to you and I as believers in Christ, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind. That is going to take place at salvation. It is an ongoing process throughout our salvation, and it will affect the external. And then we are told, put on and put off these certain things. In other words, we're supposed to identify we're supposed to have the evidence of being a Christian if we are a Christian. Too much of what is called Christianity today isn't Christianity. Might be religion, but it's not Christianity. You say, well, how can you judge? Because Christianity begins with the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It begins with the call for the lost to be saved, to be regenerated by Jesus Christ. That's where it begins. That's where true Christianity begins. True Christianity doesn't stop there. True Christianity is something lived out. It's how we live our life. And I would ask you, as you look at your grade on this one, has regrade yourself and see what you come up with. Now, this is one, if you want to be really serious about this, this is one that I would suggest that you take to work, well, not tomorrow, most of you got tomorrow off probably, but the next day. Don't ask a Christian to grade you on this. Ask a lost person. Go to some lost person at work and tell them, I am a Christian. I identify as a Christian. Would you be honest with me about something? Do I behave like a Christian? Or do you see something different in me? You say, well, why wouldn't you ask a Christian that? Because the average Christian in our world today doesn't know how a Christian ought to behave. The lost person does. And the lost person will call you on it. The church today across America, I can't voice what the rest of the world is doing, but across America today, the church has become so wishy-washy, so lame, so it doesn't have standards, it doesn't have any quality to it. It's a knife that is so dull that it couldn't cut hot butter. So don't ask another Christian. Ask a lost person. They'll tell you. It is amazing to hear what lost people know 
Christians ought not to be doing and what they ought to be doing. And to hear them talk about it is like, huh, how come Christians aren't saying this? Oh, because I've got grace. I can do anything I please, yada, yada, yada. Well, number one, your grace doesn't give you the right to sin. And number two, your grace doesn't give you the right to live an irresponsible life as a stumbling block. That is not what grace and Christian liberty is about. In our lives, Christians, if Jesus Christ has saved our soul, He has to change us. We ought to be different than what this world is. We ought to look different, smell different, act different, talk different, think different. Not a carbon copy of the world, not a dressed up version. We're not a pre- supposed to be a pretty version of a lost person. We're supposed to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Our identity. Where would we grade ourselves? This just gets us started. If we are going to steward our lives like we ought to, and each drop in that bucket, each second of life, it's got to be a life where our walk with the Lord is what it ought to be. It's got to be a life where our identity is crystal clear. We don't have time to wait, Christian. Time's running out. We are so close. I, Brother Justin's 100% right. Wouldn't that be great if this was the year that the Lord came back? How about, wouldn't it be great if this was the day the Lord came back? Time's running out. If you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, these are things that apply to Christians. They don't apply to you as a lost soul. You've got to be born again. You've got to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. The Lord's got to make a change in you, starting on the inside. And this morning, lost soul without Christ as your Savior, the Bible teaches very, very clearly that an eternity in hell is in your future. And that is something that is closer than you could possibly imagine. But Jesus Christ came to this earth and He died on a cross for your sins. He paid the price in His blood. He was buried in the tomb. He arose again from the grave. That's the gospel message. There's nothing else to it. And you have to make that decision this morning. Will I accept what Jesus did for me? Will I repent of all the things I've been trying to do? And that's where I think it's difficult because if you've got somebody who has been lost for a lot of years and you've been trying so hard for so many years to get right with God, to do right, to be a better person, New Year's, I've got New Year's resolutions, I'm going to be a better person this year than I was last year. It is hard for you to repent of those things and say, no, I'm giving all that up and I'm trusting Jesus. Because that has been so ingrained in your thinking that you've got to do something for your salvation. When Jesus Christ did it all, He did every bit of it. There's nothing you can possibly do. Well, I got to get baptized. Not for salvation. Well, I got to take communion. Not for salvation. Well, I got to be a member of a church then. Not for salvation. Well, I just have to do better and try harder. Not for salvation. For salvation, you repent and believe the gospel message. And it's that simple. If you're here today, you haven't done that. Would you give us the opportunity to take you aside and open God's Word with you and introduce you to Jesus? Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Heavenly Father, this morning, if our grade in just these two points hasn't been so great, and we need to do business with you this morning as believers in Christ, we need to get some things right and get them right quickly. And Lord, I just pray that as Christians that we would examine our hearts and lives in relation to these things. But Lord, for that lost soul this morning, they need to be saved. And I just pray that even today, that the conviction of your Holy Spirit would be so strong in their life that they just can't say no any longer, and that today would be the day they'd give their life to you. May we have the privilege to start a new year out by leading somebody to Christ. In his name we pray.